Hello Cinnabar Moths or any kind of moth you'd like to be. Welcome to the Writer's Triangle Cinnabar Moths podcast about all things publishing and books. Today I am here by myself. This is the first time that I am doing a solo podcast for the Writer's Triangle and I will be talking about my process with writing my book which was uh, The Pixies in the Mist and I'll be doing that on my own. So hi, I this is a little bit unusual for me. Usually I have somebody here that I'm interviewing so this is kind of an, a different experience for me overall with just uh, being on my own, not having somebody to, to talk with. For those of you who are missing Christopher, unfortunately, uh, you'll have to wait for a little bit longer before you can hear Christopher's lovely voice again. But for now, you have me. Now, for today's topic about Pixies in the Mist and the writing process, I want to talk a little bit more into the history of what I actually started off with like writing and how it began. The original inspiration for Pixies in the Mist actually isn't some story that I had in mind already that I wanted to write. And instead, what happened was I was like, I need, I want to write a book, but I don't really know how to get started. And I think that this might be something that other people have experienced. I don't know, but having like this creative drive in you, so to speak, that you want to put out there, but then not really having <laughs> much direction for it, I guess, is kind of the experience that I had. And so what I did was I went online and I found a bunch of different writing prompts. I went through maybe 20 or 30 before I found one that was interesting to me. And it was, if I recall correctly, the writing prompt was your character wakes up and finds that they have a magical tattoo on their body that just appeared out of nowhere. What happens? And that was the entire prompt. There was nothing more, no history or anything, and I just had to create everything from there. And so I started off with, okay, I have this character who has a, a tattoo. How do I go from there? And it really evolved into something completely beyond just the tattoo. In fact, the the tattoo that Jake, the main character, ends up having is a very, very small portion of the story and doesn't really play into it as heavily as I would have first expected. And the the process of writing that and the direction it took was just fueled by my own imagination and what I thought would be interesting and would make sense for uh, this type of character that I had in mind. I didn't really set out with a specific goal of writing a dark story to start with, but I think maybe that's just how my mind works. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad... Is that a bad sign about me? I might actually... Uh, am I just dark? Is that is that a descriptor for me? I don't think so. In real life, I'm not that dark, but my thought process for the book ended up being a rather more dark story on the scale of things with certain... I mean... If you look at the content warnings, there's some things about like loss of limb and abduction, gaslighting, which all happen. But the, the original starting point was just this writing prompt where it was just a prompt to write a story about someone with a magic a tattoo that appeared out of nowhere. And it took its own it took a it took on a life of its own in a lot of ways. I started off with just the one character who admittedly has a lot of basis in my own experiences in life. I I live in Japan, so that's the starting point. I moved from the United States, so there were some aspects of my personal experiences in life taken into it, like with dancing salsa and the salsa community in Japan. Those are all things that I personally have experienced. And so I started from something very concrete, because I hadn't written a lot before that book, actually, when it comes to fiction by myself. I'd done some 
role-playing stuff where I had interacted with other people via text and we'd written like more collaborative storytelling or like Dungeons and Dragons based role-playing and more real-time on-the-moment improv style things but I hadn't actually had experience just sitting down and writing even a short story really on my own so this was very new for me in that regard and I started off very lacking in confidence and as things went on I started to become more become more confident but the starting point was very much oh I don't know will this actually be good what should I write about and uh, for those of you out there who are experienced this as well the only thing that I found that worked for me was to just keep writing and ignore and do my best to ignore that feeling and be like okay this first draft is not going to be good. I just have to admit, I don't know what I'm doing. It's going to be a mess, and that's okay. We can start with the mess. We can always fix something that we've created, but we can't fix something that doesn't exist. So this was advice that I actually got from Christopher, was just get words on the page. You can't do anything unless you have words on the page. And so that was my starting point, was just, getting the words on the page and seeing what was there and the initial version for Pix in the Mist and the initial ideas for it were very different than the world that I created in the end and only a few of the aspects really remained the same like even my starting point for Jake was quite different from what I had originally imagined because I didn't have him studying English instead I had him working uh, I had a completely different like direction that I expected him to take and a different basis for his character that I ended up completely changing because I felt like it didn't really make sense for a character of this type to end up in the scenarios that I ended up writing later on. So for those of you who are struggling with making it all make sense from the very beginning, some, some of you might be able to do that. I think there are some writers out there who are just better than me at this, who can create that cohesion from the get-go. But for those of you who, like me, struggled, I would suggest just getting it out, getting the words out, getting that story written, and then once you have all the pieces kind of like scattered about being a, being okay with just shaping them and molding them to fit each other after which is basically how <laughs> I did it was I just admitted to myself that I'm going to have a bunch of disjointed pieces that all loosely are tied together but don't really fit as cleanly as they need to to make a proper story and that that's okay. And getting there was difficult but I ended up getting there. And then from there I with Pixies in the Mist I started working on other characters and that includes like Kenneth and his boss and the like Rivera and a bunch of other characters I don't want to spoil anybody on any of these if you haven't read it already but the experience for me was very much about okay I'm gonna base this character off of people that I've seen and experiences that I've had and have that be the foundation for my concept for how they think because I struggled with doing any just purely off the top of my head no reference point this is a human a uh, human being or this is a, a pixie or this is a creature that has these thoughts completely untied from anything else because it made it difficult for me to actually imagine how they would act and behave in the world and so instead what I did was I looked back over my experience of meeting a ton of people over the years because I, I have been very social and I've met just m many different vibrant personalities and honestly not so vibrant personalities. There have been people that I got along with very well, people I didn't get along with, but in the process of getting to know all these different people, I learned a lot about how different people would act in these certain scenarios and just kind of stole from that and that's 
something that I, with the ones that are references to people that I met that I was no longer in contact with, I just kind of worked it, worked it out and thought of it on my own. But some of them I took pieces from even uh, Kistopher's personality, for example, and a few of my friends' personalities. And I was like, hey, if you're in this situation, how would you react? Like, you're, you're suddenly put in this scenario, right? You, here's your background. Here's your bit. You're in this situation. What would be your reaction to this? And that helped me a lot with kind of formulating how I felt the character would end up reacting. Because I didn't just take it wholesale from them, but I took bits and pieces from their different reactions and my friends' different ideas about how they would proceed if they were put in that scenario to think about, okay, these are the types of things that people would reasonably think rather than just falling into the trap that I initially fell into with my first writing of it, of what just makes the story continue. Because my first bit was just, how did I just make this work continue? And then in my second going through it, I took more references for what would actually make sense for a person or a pixie or an entity to do. If your motives are this, what does that mean? And digging more into the motives of my characters rather than just having this basic shell of personality. Because personality and motive are a little bit different. And so I I built everything from a very character-oriented perspective. And then also had this world that was where they existed. And so I had the characters in the world were my two starting points. I had Jake, Kenneth, and all of them have their personality shells. And then I dug deeper into their motivations. Like Jake's motivation was figuring out what the hell is going on. That was the basic motivation for him was what the hell is going on and how can I, you know, embrace my power? Because Jake comes into his own and tries to understand what's going on with this new, completely different world and type of existence that that he's used to and these these new powers that he gains over the course of the story and figuring out what the limits of what he can do are and, you know, trying to survive when there's creatures out there who would rather that he doesn't. (laughs) And dealing with these difficult scenarios and figuring things out when nobody really wants you to fully figure anything out and how to overcome that sort of barrier of not having any true help and needing to be self-sufficient while maneuvering your way through completely foreign experiences, which I think is something that is relatable for me in certain scenarios because I have gone first time to different like places or to different events and been completely lost and just struggling to keep up. <laughs> Obviously not with anything magical because there's no magic, but... Or if there is, I just haven't been let in on the loop. What the heck? But I uh, have drawn from my own experience with that and from talking with people about their experiences being in, uh, for example, a foreign country. Isn't, despite the lack of magic, it is in some ways very similar to being in a magical world with all these new rules and expectations and understandings that you just don't have any context for. And so I I drew a lot of his reactions and his thought processes from the perspective of I'm in a place where everybody has context but me and nobody really is willing to give me the full story. So I have to figure it out on my own. So that was Jake's kind of evolution was he's just some person in Japan and then he gets thrown into magical world and then drawing more from, okay, what, how would he want to proceed as things get crazier and crazier and more and more involved, what would his reaction be and how would he make this make sense in his mind when his world's been turned upside down, essentially? And then Kenneth was kind of the opposite, where he's a character that has all of the information, basically. Not truly all of it, but most of it. He has the full context. He's, you know, Kenneth's a pixie, so he's been living in this magical world his entire life he's been going through this experience his entire life and he's been doing his job his entire life and so none of this is new to him he's experienced he's got years and years of on-the-job experience with doing what he does 
and with working with uh, magical humans like Jake and all of this. And so when it comes to this more worldly, so to speak, creature in this world that already understands magic, how it all works, and has his own motivations and his own goals within it, and fully understands what all the pieces in play are to a certain extent, then it becomes a much more controlled and measured character compared to Jake, who's essentially fumbling his way through everything and trying his best to catch up to the knowledge that he's missing. Whereas Kenneth is the opposite of and as a character who's competent and capable and trying his best to meet the demands of the different places where he's being stretched thin and make it all work while juggling the fact that he has to deal with Jake, who is a essentially a landmine thrown into Kenneth's functionality and working around that and making sure that he still gets his job done in all different aspects and not dropping the ball in any of them and kind of that struggle of having of being of being good at what you do but having the situation be such that you don't have the the just the time and the resources to manage everything all the time and that creates openings in the story for Jake to no longer be under Kenneth's supervision, for example, and be forced to not have that su- support, but also not have somebody who's watching over Jake's shoulder to limit what he can do within what Kenneth's goals, because Kenneth is motivated to, for something different from Jake. And that sort of balancing act of Jake needs time to act on his own, and this is the opening that's created from Kenneth just simply having a lot of stuff to do that isn't about Jake. And so those are the kind of the two main characters that I had play back and forth. And then a lot of the other characters are characters that will either come back again later or are, you know, one-off characters. And my mind for them would be just a matter of, okay, well, if they're going to come back, then I want them to be situated in a way that we understand who or what they are and there's enough left to be discovered but they at least have a solid personality to reflect on and interact with for the reader because i wanted each one to be fleshed out to at least some extent and what happened with that for me and was one of my bigger struggles that i had to work through was not getting distracted while writing the story and i because i built a world along with these individual characters, I end up fleshing out a history behind some of these side characters that would never get revealed in the Pixies in the Mist at all. It would just never come up. And so there there are these several characters that have their own vibrant histories that I made, and I was just like, but I want to write this story about them now. And it's and I had to get, slap myself in the hand and be like, no, stop. That's not what this story is about. We can't go into this. <laughs> And keeping myself on task was um, one of the bigger struggles for me. And the world itself has its own rules and functionality that I think every writer, when they when they go into fantasy and fiction, has to make a sense of the world for themselves and has to create rules that they kind of abide to and follow when they are operating. Because if you if anything goes, you can kind of go in that more uh kind of super fantastical style where there you can just shuck all the rules of normal like worldly and earthly concepts and be like okay throw everything you know out the window to a certain point but there's always going to have to be some foundation for people to react and interact with and because mine's more on the realistic fiction kind of the more urban fiction and fantasy style a lot of the stuff still has to make sense on earth like jake can't suddenly just not have to breathe anymore and he still needs to eat because he's still a human being he doesn't just get to ignore that and function within the world and uh with that balance of okay the world is created it has all these unique rules to it both with the magical world that are different from the human world but are still connected to earth 
and working that through, I end up discovering a lot about the side characters and fleshing them out. And then also that actually, once I got myself back on task, I was able to say, okay, this, this actually makes it easier to write out the interactions between these characters because I know, okay, uh, this character has a desire to just keep their job. That's all they want. They just want to live a simple, a simple life where th- they do their job and they, they go home and that's all they want. Or this character is very ambitious and so that's going to change how they interact with the main characters when they do come up and and kind of having these motivations fleshed out in my mind really helped me to make them feel more real to myself and hopefully uh, the readers also enjoyed the interplay between the characters uh, and speaking of the interplay between the characters with Jake and Kenneth there were a lot of interactions between them that I felt uh made them seem almost like friends and it was kind of a struggle for me to separate them and uh, keep them clear that Kenneth was not Jake's friend and that his role as like a friend in Jake's mind was purely him doing his job and that's something that I felt rather insecure about when writing that I wasn't sure if I actually got that across and I wanted to have them be cordial with each other and have this kind of background where they've, you know, been around each other a lot and interact with each other in this friendly manner a lot. But then that dynamic gets flipped when Jake discovers the truth about things and Kenneth then reverting more to his natural self as this professional together kind of stand office personality that he normally would have with uh uh jake if they had just met normally rather than under the original guise of friendship that they had and so that was one of my main focuses with the story was making sure that they seemed like friends up until the point that it was clear that they weren't from jake's perspective and kind of balancing that to where kenneth never really actually makes a true connection with jake even as he plays it out and trying to make that seem like a genuine interaction between them, despite Kenneth not actually feeling any true warmth towards Jake in the process. So that was something that was uh, quite a challenge for me. And looking back on it, I'm still not actually fully confident that I did that as well as I could have. And I'm, I think that other authors and writers might connect with this, but I feel like I could have done a better job and at certain portions if I think back over it. But at the same time, it's already out there. It's already done. And I've gotten, you know, there have been positive reviews and positive feedback from people. And so I let that kind of buoy me against some of the insecurity that I have with having written something that's out there. And yeah. I think that's it for when it comes to talking about the interplay between them. And then for the world building itself, that was probably the most exciting aspect for me with the book. Even though I've talked a lot about the characters, the world building is what really drew me in. And it's probably one of my favorite things about writing in general is creating this world where characters and creatures and entities interact and are forced to come together with conflicts or with working together to overcome conflict and things of that nature is creating those rules and kind of building something from a familiar yet different perspective because I want my fantasy world to be my fantasy world and not the fantasy world of a a book that I read you know five years ago that kind of would if it's too similar then it's not my writing anymore but when with building the world i end up having all these different characters that have to populate it all these different creatures and it was really exciting for me to think about okay what is actually the background behind the mist in pixies in the mist and what is it exactly and thinking about all these things that never actually get told to the reader 
or some of these things that never get told to you guys as readers uh, it, are my favorite aspects of the book itself that just never get shared. <laughs> and it's kind of a, a kind of a strange thing to me to think about, but it's exciting to me to have written them and to have thought them through, even though I know that it's not something that'll ever truly be discussed with the reader. And it's, huh, I hadn't thought of it actively like this way before. It's something I'd kind of been aware of, but just now I had an epiphany. I really enjoyed the process of creating something, which saying it now is probably, <laughs> it probably sounds weird because I wrote a book. I was creating something the entire time. I created these stories. You know, creativity was the source and the fuel for all of this. and My imagination is the source for it. But I really enjoyed the act of creation, even without the the need for it to be something that the reader interacted with. There's obviously the portion of this, there's the book itself, which has all the stuff that the reader interacts with and thinks about and gets to see. But there's always so much more behind the scenes that never really gets discussed and never really gets to be revealed and see the light of day and be open for the readers to interact with in a single writing of a book that I I think back over and I don't I don't think of it now as like I wish I could introduce this to readers so much as wow I really thought all of this through and that was cool and exciting. I I get to kind of think back over it and be like, that was cool and exciting. If somebody were to talk to me about it, I would I would be excited to share all of my thoughts and ideas with them but there was no place for it in the story. And that's something that I'm okay with now. And when I was first starting, I was really not okay with the reader not getting everything. I was like, I must include everything. If I don't include everything, how are they going to truly enjoy the story? And now I feel like I've calmed down having written it. And, you know, through the process, I had to, you know, pull it back and scale it back. And that was most of what I was doing was actually scaling it back and then Scaling it back and then also being like, okay, how do I make these things connect to each other? Scaling it back and then being like, okay, now that we've removed all the stuff that the reader doesn't need to know but is important for this story to make sense in a kind of like a background fashion, how do we how do we make the foreground make sense as well? And how do we flesh out the foreground so that it is the majority? Because most of my writing end up being about a lot of things that were background pieces and were kind of the underpinnings and the the flow and the creation of the world and the basis and foundation for everything that the reader ends up actually seeing. Because I had to I had to think about like the history, for example, of the Pixies and their existence in the world and the kind of the political backdrop to the balance of power within the, the magical world and the different factions that exist within it and the different characters and how they grew to to become where they are with today in in today in the story that and none of that gets revealed in the end but it was really exciting to write it <laughs> in my own mind and and then pulling it back I don't actually feel bad about it I when I was writing a lot when I was for like college and when I would do role play writing and such, I always felt bad about the things that I cut out because I felt like I was not doing justice to the full information, the full facts when I was doing nonfiction stuff for, for my college assignments or for my writing in fiction being like, I'm not doing full justice to the, the whole background and story of the character. And now I feel like I've, I kind of, in writing Pixies in the Mist, I've understood the fact that not everything needs to be shared. In fact, most of the things don't be isn't aren't aren't going to get shared. And the final product of the book is maybe about thirty to forty percent of what actually gets written and fleshed out and developed to make that thirty percent work and feel cohesive and come together in a way that is clean and makes sense. And this was kind of a long ramble, I think. I mean, y'all y'all deal with Christopher, so you're used to people rambling. And I'm sure that this is 
maybe a different way of rambling, but I'd like to hope that I stayed enough on topic talking about the kind of the experience with writing. And in the end, I think the, the key thing is always just if you're unsure about writing or you're not confident, the the first step is being like, okay, I don't need to be confident. I don't need to even be good. My first draft, I think I did five or six iterations of Pixies in the Mist during the time that I wrote it that were wildly different from each other. And if you're writing, it's okay to have wildly different results and to have all these things that you don't include. And, you know, get it out there first, you know, flesh it out for yourself. Embrace your creativity and let it flow onto the page. Let it pour. Let it flood the the pages, you know? And then from there, you can go back and kind of trim it down. It's a lot easier to trim things down and to connect things together when you have excess than when you have too little. So that would be my advice, I guess, would be to just do too much the first couple of times, even the first five times even. You know, however many times it takes, just do too much first and then scale it back after. That way you can have all the pieces, you know, on the table, all the cards on the table, whatever your metaphor you like, and you can then just decide which ones you actually need and want to keep in the end product. So yeah, uh, I I hope that made sense. I hope that was useful or interesting to you guys uh, and, and gals and non-binary pals. I have a habit of saying you guys, I'm working on stopping it. Uh, I should just say folks and y'all more often. So thank y'all for listening. I hope that you enjoyed it. And I will catch you all, probably not in another individual podcast for a little bit. Or maybe I will. We'll see. But I will catch you all in an interview. Uh, And I hope that you all have a wonderful weekend or whatever time you're listening to this. I hope you all do well. Thank you all for listening and bye-bye.